the amazing Kathy Richardson. Hey, good morning. So, uh, last week when I was here, my father was in hospice and went up to the hospital after, after the service and hung out with him all day and uh, he, he passed on. And uh, it was uh, one of the most amazing experiences. And I was with my mom when she passed away too, so I knew I didn't want to miss it because if you ever get a chance to be with someone when they transition, it's like, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a sad thing, but it's a beautiful thing too. And um, so just a little backstory. We were, uh, we'd been around him the whole day and uh, his lady friend that I don't get along with. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. She left the room. And Rachel noticed, not a minute later, his breathing has changed. And uh, so I ran up to him. I said, oh, my God, this is it. Because I recognized from being with my mom, this is it. So it was my sister, my brother, my wife, Rachel, my brother's husband, Israel, my sister's husband, Doug. And uh, Doug's brother, who had just happened to come by to like pay his last respects, I don't think he was meaning to be there then, but he was. So we got all around my dad, and um, we'd been playing a Beatles playlist. Um, and uh, I noticed um, the song. I didn't. I'm like, what song is playing? It you know must be significant, whatever it is. And it was. I didn't know the song. I didn't know what it was. I ran over to my computer and looked, and it was called She's Leaving Home. And I'm like, she's leaving home. You know? <laughs> and then the next song that came on was For the Benefit of Mr. Kite, which is, you know, I was nobody wants to die listening to that song. It's too weird. <laughs> so I changed it. Uh, I changed it to Across the Universe, and, uh, which was a perfect song. The entire song played. It faded out. I grabbed my phone because I was looking at the time. It was 4.43. The clock changed to 4.44, and he took one last breath. And I was like waiting, and I'm like, that was it. Oh my God, that was so awesome. Thank you, Dad, that was so perfect. And it was like, it couldn't, like, like Ron said in his story at Voice Box, if someone had written that in a movie script, I would call bullshit. Like, there's no way it could be that perfect. I don't know if you're... If you guys are tuned in like I am to 444 being an angel number, and it's a big, big number and a symbol in my life, and the fact that he crossed exactly at 444, exactly after this song end, exactly after what's her name left the room, it was so perfect. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to sing across the universe now, and um, there's a little Sanskrit prayer in this song called, uh, it's Jai Guru Deva, and that basically means joy, praise, glory to the shining, the shining remover of darkness. Okay, so just sing along. <laughs> slither out, they pass and slip away across the universe. Pools of sorrow, waves of joy are drifting through my open mind, possessing and caressing me. Change. 
Bridges of broken light Which dance before me like a million eyes They call me on and on for across the universe Thoughts meander like a restless wind Inside a letterbox They tumble blindly as they make their way Across the universe talking about intentional audaciousness where we get to kind of step in before we're ready you know without somebody else's approval or permission because we've been preordained by God so um, the conversation was on intentional audaciousness so uh, the, the thing that's been going on lately is that there's a lot of change happening right a lot of shifts a lot of change uh, a lot of whirling and swirling, moving kind of like a whirling dervish. Some of us feel like a, a whirling dervish with all the change that's happening. And uh, things are spinning, and we can feel disoriented in that spinning of things, right? Um, and last week we spoke about the shifting of things and how we experience shifts and how we can navigate shifts in a more intentional and optimal way. So we can either go to it with, like, clutching, like this is happening, or we could go to it, you know, open. Now, when you go through change like this, it's really uncomfortable. But the thing is, when you go through change like this, it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> it just is. Change is uncomfortable. But this, this, as opposed to this, also feels audacious and bold and a degree of fearlessness. You know, and that's really who we're here to be. We're not going to eradicate fear. We can experience this experience of fear and do it anyhow, you know, writing that letter. You know, there was probably some shaking of the knees. You know, saying yes to that invitation is like, oh my gosh, you're on the cusp of do I stay or do I go? And you just have to, you get to move forward, you know, not like this though. So um, lately I've been practicing this. And I don't know about you, but um, the swirling of things, um, in the swirling of things while I go like this, I experience, surprisingly, great freedom and happiness, which I didn't know was there. That's why I try and go through things like this, because I didn't really trust that this would bring great freedom and happiness. And there's a place within me that probably lives within you that says, well, who am I even deserving of that degree of limitless audaciousness and happiness? 
and it's the, the, the belief that we aren't that causes us to go in like this. So, um, you know, Kathy talked about the shift that happened in her family recently, that uh, that was a shift, you know, and that she kind of breathed through it like this and said, whoa, instead of what the normal script of the movie of the week tells us, it was like, oh, like she was like, that was audacious. And as we continue to see new scripts being written with a pen of audaciousness, we get to experience a more expansive uh, uh, version of a story. We get to see that there's more things on the menu than just what the, win the, the ideas that we've been tr um, told to conform to, which is, cr is awesome. So um, uh, in experiencing this and in experiencing that greater degree of happiness or joy, that, didn't, that doesn't just happen. Like you have to practice that. You have to be diligent and devoted to practicing moving into your life like this. And, um, you know, I, I, I spend my time in devotion and service and, and taking the direction of a, higher, of a higher hand. Now, we get confused when we confuse the higher hand with the hired hand. You know? Like, God's not our hired hand. You know, we sit here and we're like, God, get me that. Move this over here and smite him. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> and we think, well, why aren't my prayers working? You know, well, they're not working because God has no investment in your smallness. God doesn't even think about those things. God's looking towards your audaciousness. And so until you, until you start praying audacious prayers, you do not have a co-partner in God. You know, you're literally blocking the ability for God to be of service to you. So, um, you know, some people say, like, um, um, we might, say, um, we might say, when you begin to approach this recognition that God wants to collaborate with your brilliance, um, that, you, that in that collaboration, you will begin to experience uh, your rightful state of joy that comes from the, a degree of that surrendering into God. And, 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 and I know that I have, and I'm witnessing other people experiencing the benefits of that surrender. Um, Honestly, it really feels like unlike anything I've ever experienced before. You know, as good as it gets, we keep hearing God just keeps getting better. And it's kind of cool to witness, like, that's true. Like, as good as it gets, you can't outgood God. And God keeps getting better and better and better. And if we are on course with this idea of God, or you could substitute the word God for love, you will also experience an ever-expanding experience of freedom, of joy. I, I think that's audacious and maybe something we don't hear enough of. So um, uh, then there's a place within me that says, gosh, it, can it really be this good? And who am I to be this happy? In the face of all the struggles and, and brokenness in the world, we've, you know, this week alone in Florida, horrific. Who am I to experience happiness? You know, um, and I think, is it okay at this hour to be spinning in happiness like a whirling dervish? And my divine says, yes. Yes, it's more than okay. It's necessary. It's necessary that you show up this way. Well, thank you. My audience of one. <laughs> and my divine says, you know, it's, uh, my dear, it's more than okay. It's necessary because happiness is your function. And you're no, of no help to me if you're not happy. And you want to say, well, I shouldn't really be happy in the face of this. And the divine says, well, then let your heart break. Let it break and break and break and break a million times until it finally just breaks the fuck open. Right? Yeah, and when it breaks open, you experience great, a greater degree of happiness. This is what Rumi says. Rumi says, keep breaking your heart until it opens. And if you're experiencing heartbreak, then allow that to be the thing that breaks you. If you're, if you're experiencing heartbreak, let it be with purpose. You know, say to your heartbreak, this is not for nothing. There is great purpose in this heartbreak. Let it be broken open until I am absolutely free of ever experiencing heartbreak again. In fact, when my dad died, my heart was broken, shattered into a million pieces. I could barely move. You know this. Kathy might be experiencing this. It's a grief beyond what you can even explain. There's no words for it. You feel, you feel so heavy like you have cement shoes on and a billion pound woman sitting on your chest, right? So I went and did my job anyhow. And, um, but in that grief, I said to my God, I claim my happiness. This will not be for nothing. You better deliver. <laughs> Why not? You know, I'm showing up despite the grief. So you had better deliver with my blessings, God. I trust in you. If I do my part, you will deliver. And God has. 
You know, and God has delivered. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't stop in fetal position on the bathroom floor. Although we've all been there in fetal position on the bathroom floor. But that's not an address. That's, that's a stopping point that we're going to move through so that we can have a tenderization of the spirit. So, in regards to the whirling dervish, the whirling dervish comes from the Sufi religion or practice um, of followers of Rumi. And he was a 13th century Persian poet. And the whirling dervish get their name from their famous practice of whirling, which is a form of remembrance of God, a practice of attempting to achieve divine knowledge and love through the personal relationship with God. So it was a spiritual practice that they were partaking in. And here at Speakeasy, we too are um, attempting to experience personal relationships with God, whatever you choose to call your God. You don't even have to have a name for your God. You could have a nameless God. But just to have an experience of being in the flow, the fluidity of love. We say love is our religion, so you know, love is a perfect, perfectly good name for, for God. So we're open to celebrating the variety of ways we can experience and access that divine. We do it through prayer. We do it through meditation. We do it through celebration. We do it through uh, ceremony, through ritual, through going on pilgrimages. Mel Melanie's going to go to India. It's a beautiful thing, you know, to court your divine in that way and to invest in your divine relationship. That's just beautiful. Um, we do it through sacred texts. You know, we use the Course of Miracles. We use the Twelve Step. We use the Bible. We use, you know, the poetry of Rumi. We use the uh, Chicago Tribune. You know. My husband's read from the Tri Chicago Tribune here. You know, if you're reading with a holy mind, anything can be sacred text. So we use it all. Whatever it is, we use it. Um, we find God in death. We find God in drumming. We find God in the dancing of the whirling dervish. We seek and find God in all things. These are the mystical ways of connecting with the divine, to having an open and curious mind. And it's a surefire way to expand your consciousness. Um, we are called to see God in all these things, and specifically to see God where we're in resistance. So go to those places where you're in resistance and really ask the Holy Spirit to give you a reinterpretation of the situation. Um, mastering that resistance brings us spiritual resilience. You are worthy of embodying spiritual resilience. Think about that. Think about who's the most resilient person that you know. Who do you know that's walked through fire and still manages to show up with a gentle smile, a compassionate heart, and a helpful hand? And if you figure out who that is, sit at their knee and, and soak up their, their audaciousness. For me, I think of Mother Teresa. I think of Mahatma Gandhi. I think of um, Martin Luther King. I think of Jesus Christ. I think of Buddha. You know, these people did not have an easy life, but they rose despite the scenario. That's r spiritual resilience. Do not think for a minute that this and greater good shall you do. So if you were to bring that spiritual resilience into your ministry, imagine the glass ceilings you could bust open. And not just imagine it for yourself, but imagine those um, people that are waiting to be freed from the chains of their own illusions um, by your action of dedication to your divine. Like, that's who you're here to be. So, um, Kurt Vonnegut um, once wrote, and I think this is an interesting thing because it just came up for me, and, you know, uh, many of us are healers, teachers, practitioners, but also entrepreneurs, artists, you know? So we kind of live in the world, but we also are in the divine, and we kind of ride the fence. So it's like, how do we do this and that? How do we collaborate them? How do we have this holy communion between our, our mission and our ministry? So Kurt Vonnegut, he said, I once wrote that any creation which has any wholeness and harmoniousness was made by an artist or an inventor with an audience of one in mind. And as an entrepreneur, I've used this idea, this contemplation, you know, of saying, you know, how do I pay attention to my audience of one, my ideal client? If you're an entrepreneur, you might want to think about your ideal client. And personally, I've used this line of questioning to figure out who my ideal client is so that my branding, my words, everything is in greater alignment. I know who I serve and who I'm not here to serve. And, um, and maybe even times writing out a full-on description about who is my ideal client. Now, that's what I would do in business, right? But in the spiritual realm, that's a joke. <laughs> like, that's just sort of a joke. It's like almost a gimmick, you know, that helps me to get some clarity, which is good. But um, in, in the spiritual realm... Um, what I know is that my ideal client of one is God. And I, if I need to know a greater degree of my ideal client, then I just need to know God in a more intimate way. And if you don't know your God in an intimate way, then you're going to have a pretty blurry experience of life. Because really, in the end, it's just you and God. It's just you and love. 
You know, everything else here is just a teacher for us to keep us on course to that one relationship with God. When Jim talks about meditation, that's exactly what he's talking about. Going within so you can flesh out that experience of that reunion with your truest self, with your higher power. So today it's best if I let go into the mad whirling and, and swirling of God and simply enjoy the process and let everything else go. Let it fall away. Because when you're whirling towards that divine relationship in love, it's very hard to hold on to anything else. You become unattached, you become unhinged, you become unencumbered, and you become, yes, a bit disoriented. But losing your own direction, your little direction, your ego direction, is not a bad thing. You know, We don't want to lose our own sense of direction uh, because we think, oh, I, I'll lose myself. But to lose yourself in love with God will put you on course towards things you didn't even know to ask for. So the idea is to say, I give my life for this guidance today, to really tap into this guidance. Where would you have me go? What would you have me do? What would you have me say? In the 12th step, they talk about it in the 11th step. Um, they, they say, you know, sought through prayer and meditation to um, improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for its will for us and the ability to carry that out. Like that's all we need to do is figure that thing out, you know? And the more that we figure that thing out, we cause this groove of audaciousness. So when I say this morning to you, intentional audaciousness, which is what the title of the talk is, you know, it's sort of like an oxymoron because you don't need to have intention with audacious. The only thing you need to intend is to be audacious in God. All your other intentions can be let go of. Um, surrendering all your will today so that you can be open to the thoughts of God. Give God your acts. I'll use the word love. Give love your acts and actions so that you can be open to the guidance and the brilliance of love. Step back in love. It comes from this inner collaboration with the divine, which is so gentle and so tender. So um, make that your whole and holy intention, and you will see miracles if you make that your whole and holy intention. Uh, when we think about intention, intention means a thing that is intended or planned for or aimed at. And we often hear the pros and cons of intentions, like set your intentions, have an intentional life. And of course, yes, there's benefits to having intentions and setting intentions, but the intention, but intention also means that you're gonna set some sort of plan and aim and a clear idea for yourself. And I would suggest that, uh, that most times you're underestimating the audaciousness of God. You set these little plans, like, I'm going to do this and do that and do this and do that. And God's, like, laughing, like, really? Like, that's nothing that I have planned for you. I have something so much better. So anytime you're ready to drop that mediocre script of yours, like, we could get on with some really hot shit. <laughs> Thank you so much for showing up. <laughs> um, so when we're talking about intention, we're really talking about what we talk about is that consciousness that holds your dreams and desires. Yeah, build your consciousness. Yeah, expand your consciousness. You do that through, through forgiveness. You do that through working the simple principles of the St. Francis prayer, you know? Be peace, be love, be faith. Um, but really, when it comes to planting those seeds, like, be open to direction in regards to the seeds that need to be implanted in your consciousness because, again, like, God has so many great intentions for you. So, um... We turn within, and when, and when we hold this, another thing about intentions is that when we turn within and we hold this idea or this plan that we have, we hold it in tension, we're literally in tension. We're, in, we're experiencing manifestation from, an in, from a tension. We don't want to manifest from tension. We want to manifest from fluidity, from joy. It's the difference between manifesting from this, I need that chair, that guy, that job, to thy will be done, man. Let's just roll. <laughs> This is really scary. Do not get me wrong. Remember the last time we saw this pose? It didn't look good. <laughs> but what was killed off created an opportunity for a greater good to be experienced by everyone. And that's the same for you. Your ego will be killed off so that a greater good will be experienced from the vortex of you and your awesomeness that doesn't just benefit you, but benefits everyone you come in contact with. Why wouldn't you want to hop on that train? Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> so, um, because the alternative is an alternative altar. We're creating alternative altars, and if we're feeling tension with our alternative altars, we can get a real clear insight that this is not for us. 
let, pray the prayer of God, let me let it go. There is no reason for me to manifest in tension. I am about manifesting in love, and love has no tensions. So um, that's a beginner class to manifesting. Now, if you're there, if you're there manifesting in that place of tension, that's okay. Like, no blame, no shame. I'm just telling you what's the, an opportunity that's a bit higher than that. If you want to play around with that, the law of uh, attraction, we talk about it all the time. The law of attraction is a really powerful tool to have in your toolkit. If you haven't mastered it, I'm sure you all have. If you've ever manifested a parking space or like a, a rage, you've figured it out, you know? Change your thoughts, change your life, you know, be open to. Um, but if you figure that out, like, see if you can drop that. It's almost like a circus trick. Like, see if you can drop that illusion and move into reality with God, you know, where you stop telling God where to go, what to do, and what to say, and start just living in the audaciousness of God. So in the end, there's no real benefit to manifesting via intention or tensions when you have the opportunity of exploring the grand plan of God. And if we want to experience intentional audaciousness, you got to set those intentions of just being of service to love. So being intentional with love means to be to saying, let me be peace here. Let me be loving here. Let me, let me be the one that pardons this. Let me be the bigger guy to pardon this. Let me have faith here and demonstrate faith. Let me be the one who brings hope to this dark situation, this dark hour. Let me be the one that shows up in joy. You know, let me be the one to console. Let me be the one to understand. Let me be the one to extend. Let me die to my smallness and live in my audaciousness. And then say with conviction, this is my only intention is my love with my divine, my audience of one, and I'm destined to be audacious with God. Audacious means um, fearless. Isn't that beautiful? It means fearless, it means unrestrained. To be in audaciousness it means to be untethered and beyond what you even knew you could be capable of. Awesome, so when we say the word awesome, I like to use the word awesome, <laughs> you know. Yes, it's overused, you know, um, but it's, it, it's, what it means is this act of inspiring awe. Oh. When's the last time you experienced awe oh, or allowed yourself to experience awe oh, or allowed yourself to witness awe, oh, you know? A feeling of reverence is what awe is, a feeling of respect, a feeling of wonder. To be awe-inspired means that you're cultivating this art of living in awe and wonder and appreciation. And this is one simple step that can be the very thing that opens the door to greater good in your life. So that's it. To be in awe will open the door to conversations and synchronicities that will bring you into a greater awareness of more awe and more awe and more until you're literally studying who you are and then you cannot help but have it wash over you, seek into every crevice of your being and have you be an embodiment of that which you're seeking. That's what, mean, that's what it means to wake up. You know, to be an embodiment of it. No longer studying these sacred texts, but embodying them. That's the difference between looking at the ocean and being neck deep. You know, and be like, whoa. <laughs> Rumi says, there's a voice that doesn't use words. Listen. Listen to that inner voice. It knows you. It loves you. It delights in you. Listen to the music of your divine and learn to dance with the music unapologetically. And like those beautiful whirling dervishes who dance for that audience of one, that one love, that one God, that right there is intentional audaciousness. When you're doing your thing, like when you're playing your music, Kimmy, when you're playing your music, like really be, really allow yourself to, and I know you they do, or else you wouldn't be as audacious as you are. And all of us, you know, really allow yourself to plug into that divine energy that wants to light you up like it never been lit up before. You know, uh, uh, Sarah, when you go and do that work with all those beautiful people who are looking for a compassionate soul with your kind of consciousness, like really let your divine step forward in you, lighting up every room and healing by just your fucking presence. Like you're that audacious. You know, all this permission slip that you went after gives you the courage to do what you're here to do, but God has already given you the noble nod. God has already preordained you for this. So let all of that fear, that, that, um, that, um, that weird, um, you know, wondering, is this right or am I right for this, let it fall away. Because nobody gets anywhere by mistake. You know, you can stand in the power of who you are, especially when you know you're of service. Um, so anything that comes from it, Anything that comes from that audacious power will come with the ability to heal, 
with the ability to be helpful and the ability to make happy. Of Course in Miracles says to make happy means to heal, and to heal means to make happy. <laughs> Isn't that great? So allow yourself to whirl and swirl in the happy love of your divine. Amen. Amen. <laughs>intention right now one, one other thing about creating intention I really liked that I, I, I how is a diamond made <laughs>